Good morning. Good morning. Get the folks out this morning. Let's go ahead and begin the word of prayer. Please join me in prayer. Father our God, thank you for uh, this wonderful morning. Thank you for what we have just witnessed. Thank you for Joe and Jessica expressing their desire to be obedient to you and to glorify you, Lord, and entering the waters of baptism. And I pray that we would better understand what took place this morning as we look at your word. I pray that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see what your spirit wants to reveal to us this morning. And so make us good listeners uh, with softened hearts that desire to be transformed by you. And I pray that whether we have uh, seen uh, many baptisms or this is the first one, that uh, we would look at your word with fresh eyes and take away the truth that you have for us. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen. And so yeah, that was, that was wonderful, was it not, to be able to be witnesses to this? What, what a blessing, what a way to kick off 2024 to, to have two baptisms like that. And again, many of you, maybe that's, uh, that's like the, I don't know, two dozen baptism you've seen in your lifetime. Maybe you've only seen a couple of them. Maybe that's the very first time that you've seen a baptism and you're saying, what was that all about? That was different, right? For those of you who have seen many and maybe been baptized yourself, hopefully witnessing Joe and Jessica be baptized caused you for a moment at least to think about your own baptism, your own public confession, and be encouraged accordingly. That's one of the, the purposes behind it. The waters of baptism ought never to cease to be a source of blessing and encouragement to the body of Christ. But again, maybe you're not that familiar with what happened. Maybe you've never been baptized yourself and you're not really sure uh, what happened. Maybe the whole thing seems a little strange, as I said. I mean, why are these people climbing into essentially what is a big tub and being dumped under the water? What's happening here? Why is it happening? Because, let's just be honest, without a proper point of reference, it does seem sort of strange, does it not? Maybe it's left with all kinds of questions. Well, my desire this morning is that some of your questions be answered. If you saw the title when it was up there, the, the main question that we're going to try to answer is simply who should be baptized? But along with that, I pray you will also better understand what baptism is, what it is not, why we practice it, and so on. But the most important part of all of this is I don't want you to get these answers from me. I want you to receive them from the ultimate authority. I want you to receive them from Almighty God and His Word. And so that's where we're going to go to get these answers this morning. If you've been coming to our Wednesday night study over the last year and a half or so, you're quite familiar by now with the book of Acts. That's been the source of our attention on Wednesday nights. But if you're not as familiar with the book, before we get in this morning, you need to know that it's a two-part letter from a doctor named Luke to his friend Theophilus. Theophilus had questions. Who was this Jesus? What did he mean? What was he about? And so Luke says, I want to tell you about who this Jesus was. And part one is his gospel, the good news according to Luke, where he tells his friend Theophilus from eyewitness accounts, this is the life of Jesus, this is the death of Jesus, this is the resurrection of Jesus. It's all a historical reality. Well, the letter that follows, the, the second part of his two-parter, is the same eyewitness testimony approach, but this time it's what happened after Jesus returned to heaven. It's very much a bridge from his first letter and really from the other Gospels to what we know as the letters to the churches. And it also fills in many details we would be left to wonder about, things like where did this thing called Christianity actually come from? How did it spread? What was the early church like? Who's this Paul guy that wrote so many letters? We wouldn't have any of that information were it not for the book of Acts. And so it's very helpful. And we're still working our way through that book on Wednesday evenings. Certainly you're invited to come. You're encouraged to come. We'd love to have you come out. But for this morning, we're going to sort of go back to the beginning of the book, if you will, and hopefully have some of our baptism questions answered in the process. And where we're going to pick up is in chapter 2, and we're at the Feast of Pentecost. That's a, a Jewish celebration that took place 50 days after the Sunday following Passover. Guess what? That just so happened to be 50 days since Jesus has been raised from the dead, and 10 days since he has gone back to heaven, since he physically ascended in front of his followers. And his followers have been told, wait in Jerusalem, just hold tight for a little bit, because something big is coming. Something amazing is going to happen, and when it does, you'll have power to do what you've been called to do. But as it turned out, that something coming was really someone, the Holy Spirit. And on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit permanently indwelt and empowered the followers of Jesus Christ. 
The evidence of this power was immediately apparent. Why? Well, the apostles started speaking in languages they didn't know. People had come from all over the known world for this feast, this feast at Pentecost, and they were hearing their languages spoken by these seemingly uneducated men from mostly Galilee. And so to say it was shocking was an understatement. But one of the apostles, Peter, he saw it for what it really was. This is an opportunity to be a genuine witness for Jesus. And so he did what the Holy Spirit empowered him to do. He preached a spirit-filled message. He preached about Jesus. He told his audience about the unjust death of Jesus at the hand of sinners. How he was the fulfillment of the prophecies of old. He preached about his resurrection and his exalted position at the right hand of God as both Lord, that is the ultimate authority, the only sovereign one, and Christ, the long-awaited Messiah, the anointed one of God. How he had been rejected by the same people he came to save. It was a powerful message that left many of his listeners rocked to their very core. That's where we're going to pick up this morning for our purposes. And so if you want to follow along in your Bible, it's Acts chapter 2. We're going to look at just verses 37 through 41 this morning. And it will be on the screen for you to follow along. Acts chapter 2 beginning in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were acutely distressed. They said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, What should we do, brothers? Peter said to them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. With many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this perverse generation. And so those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 people were added. And that's Acts chapter 2, 37 to 41. So remember, this morning we're asking the primary question, who should be baptized? Well, the first thing to see is that baptism is for those convicted of sin. Those convicted of sin. Contrary to the lie that you've been told most of your life, people are not mostly good. Period. The great lie is that humanity is comprised of mostly good people who occasionally mess up and do bad things. You've been told that lie your entire life because it deadens the pain. And yeah, the conviction that comes from being a sinner, but that doesn't change the fact that it is a lie. The, the truth is that people are spiritually and morally bankrupt. There's none righteous, Scripture says, not even one. Again, that's not my assessment of humanity. That's God's. His word clearly states, all have sinned and fallen short of the glorious standard of God. Friends, you don't become a sinner when you mess up and sin. You sin because you're already a sinner, and that's what sinners do. That's an important distinction. Amen. Let me say it another way. All of humanity since Adam has been born dead. Alive physically, sure but spiritually dead in their trespasses and sins. That's the universal condition of mankind. Every single person has thought things, they've said things, they've done things that offend God and violate His standard of holiness. That is the truth. But just because people have sinned and continue to sin doesn't mean that they care about their sin. In fact, most people could care less about offending a holy God. It's much easier to just pretend that God doesn't exist and do whatever I feel like doing than it is to come to terms with the fact that there is a God. One who is perfect in his holiness and righteousness and one that I have repeatedly offended. Most people don't give a second thought to their sin. That is, unless something wakens them up, wakes them up, we would call that being convicted of sin. That's exactly what happened to some of those who listened to Peter's message. Verse 37 again. Now when they heard this, they were acutely distressed and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, What should we do, brothers? When they heard this, when they heard what? When they heard Peter's message that Jesus is the Christ. He is the long-awaited Messiah. He's none other than the Son of God. And guess what? You participated in killing him. When they heard that, the response was intense conviction. Look what it says. They were acutely distressed. Some of your other translations say they were cut to the heart. It's a strong term. It has the idea of a combination of extreme remorse and anxiety. 
I'm sure each of us can relate at some level. Okay, can you think of a time where you did something, and maybe it was right away, or maybe it took some time, but, but at some point an awareness rose up in you, what I did was wrong, and, and your conscience was struck by it. You were cut to the heart. You were acutely distressed. All of a sudden your insides sort of started quaking that you had that feeling before of impending doom where, where you, it kind of swirls around in you. We've all felt it. Because even if people reject the existence of God, even if people suppress the truth of his righteousness, they cannot deny the existence of an internal compass of right and wrong. That's the conscience. That is evidence of God's common grace restraining evil within the world. These people who heard Peter's message, they were conscience-stricken. They're feeling the weight of their sin, and they naturally have the question that any of us would have. What should we do? Because nobody feels convicted and goes, wow, this is great. I would love to feel this all the time. I really enjoy this swirling doom that haunts my every thought. No. We all have that same question. What should I do? How do I stop feeling this way? How do I get rid of this conviction? That's a natural question, but not every answer to that question is a good answer. Because the truth is that not all conviction is addressed the right way. As much as we might hate the feeling of being convicted, conviction is a gift from God. Amen. Thank you. It's meant to wake us from our stupor, to arouse in us a sense, all is not right. In fact, much is wrong. We are headed for trouble here. But friends, merely feeling bad is not enough. There is a sadness, there's an acute distress that comes simply because we got caught doing the things that we ought not to do. Scripture calls that worldly sorrow. It's a sadness that laments the fact that we were busted and now I don't get to do the wicked things that I really like doing. It's a sadness that pushes us to think about all the ways we might do it differently next time so I don't get caught then. It's a sadness that produces a fresh level of scar tissue around our consciences so next time I won't feel as bad when I do get caught because my conscience is deadened a little bit. You see, friends, every time we're convicted, we have a choice. Will we suppress that conviction? Will we shrug it off and make excuses for why those feelings are everyone else's fault and not our own? I mean, what's the thought? Well, who cares if everybody else says it's wrong? It makes me happy, so I'll do it. Or even more prevalent is the idea, well, who cares if some made-up God says it's wrong? It's a bunch of nonsense concocted to scare people into submission and missing out on their best life. You could respond to conviction that way. And if you do, you will find yourself sinking deeper into the muck of despair and destruction. Or, you could see that conviction for what it is. It is a gift of God meant to lead you to repentance. Conviction, as God intends, results in a complete transformation. It is life-altering in the best way possible. So who should be baptized? Well, first, those convicted of sin, but it's more than that. Merely feeling convicted is not enough. What you do with that conviction matters. And so the next thing to see is that baptism is for those who have changed their thinking about sin. Have you felt the sting of conviction? Of course you have. We all have at one time or another, but, but what did you do with that conviction? I wonder, for just a moment, are some of you perhaps right here, right now, feeling the sting of conviction today, this morning? Are you bringing to mind things you have thought, things you have said, things that you have done that miss God's mark? Things that you know deep down have offended a holy God? Good. But my question is, what will you do with that? I hope you won't dismiss it. I hope you won't suppress it. Because... The purpose of conviction is not just to figure out how to make it go away. The purpose of conviction is to lead you to repent, which is precisely what Peter instructs his audience to do. Remember the question, what should we do? Here's Peter's answer. Peter said to them, repent. And each one of you be baptized. Peter, we're crushed. We're acutely distressed. We're cut to the heart. We can't take the weight of this conviction. What should we do? Notice what Peter didn't say. He didn't say, don't worry about it. God just wants you to be happy. 
But he also didn't say, tell you what, make sure you offer a couple extra sacrifices this week. Give a few more denarii to the offering box and everything will be fine. No, no, no. His answer is simple and definitive. He says, repent. This is not optional from Peter. This is an imperative. It's a command. You want to know what you should do? You need to repent. You must repent. And some of you are saying, great, you keep saying that. I have no idea what you're talking about. That's not a word that we use too often nowadays, to our detriment. Theologically, you'll most commonly hear repentance referred to as turning. Specifically, a turning from sin. I was going this sinful way, something happened, I'm convicted, and now I've turned, and I'm not going that way anymore. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that definition. It's not bad. It's just not complete enough. If you have been around here long enough, you've heard us say it is a turning, yes, but it's a turning that starts in your inner being. It's a change of heart about something, a change of thinking toward it. But it's not some slight departure. It's a radical, total person change. Let me give you an example. Let's say I used to think that I would find satisfaction in stuff, accumulating as many things as possible. And so, so maybe I started by working hard to get more money, but that wasn't enough. And so I compromised here and there to make more money. I entered into a few shady business deals. I cheated a few people here and there, but, but hey, I made more money, and that more money will get me more stuff, and that makes me happy. But it's still not enough. And so now I've gone into debt to get more stuff. Debt I have no intention of ever paying. And so, oh well, I'll just default on that debt, I'll declare bankruptcy, and I'll start it all over. Stuff, stuff, stuff. Maybe that's how I used to think. But then something happened, and by God's grace, I was convicted by those sinful thoughts and actions, and now I have a choice. I can push that down. I can ignore it. I can attempt to even soothe my pain with more stuff. Or I can acknowledge that what I did was actually sinful. Yes. It was wrong. It offended a holy God. I can confess it as sinful. I can say the same thing about those actions that God says. That's what confession is. Confession is not telling somebody else what you did. It's saying, Lord, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is wrong with yourself. So I, I can do that, and then, by God's grace, I can change my thinking about it because he changes me. Instead of thinking that stuff will satisfy me, and so I should stop at nothing to get it, I can rightly conclude that satisfaction is only found in a right relationship with God. Amen. And so I can learn to be content with what God has given me and know, if I'm right with him, I have everything I need, and the rest is bonus. And so now, do I work hard? Yeah. But I do so honestly. I work with integrity. I'm a good steward with what I've been given. I don't rack up crazy debts that I can't pay. I live contently within my means. Now friends, that's just one example. That's one generic example, but hopefully you see the truth of it. Repenting is a turning, yes, but it's more than a turning. It's a whole being transformation that starts in the mind as displayed in the actions that follow. So when Peter told his audience to repent, you better believe they understood what needed to happen. They need to change their thinking about who Jesus was and their relationship to him. Because what was their thinking? Well, for some of them, it's he's just a carpenter from this sketchy village up in Nazareth. He, he's a man with a questionable background who thought he could start challenging the religious leadership of the day. He's a man who elevated himself to a position he had no right to occupy. For some, he was a heretic. For some, a false teacher. For some, a false king. For some, a charlatan who performed miracles by dark powers. Now sure, maybe some of them thought of him as a rabbi, a teacher, a good man even, maybe even a prophet. But you know what? Even they needed to repent, to change their thinking. Because each and every one of them needed to receive Jesus for who he really was, not who they mistakenly thought him to be. Well, who was he? Peter told him. He's the Lord. He is the supreme authority over all that is. And he's the Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one of God. He's also the one they had killed and they should have worshipped instead. They needed a complete about-face in their thinking and their actions. And no, this change would be demonstrated by what? By their baptism. Look at the command again. Repent! 
change your mind, change your mind to the point it changes your behavior, but then be baptized. Each one of you, notice this, each one had to act individually. Nobody could do it for them. They had to personally change their thinking about sin and then personally demonstrate that change through the waters of baptism. You have to understand that for the Jews listening to Peter's message, this is some radical stuff. Baptism wasn't typically for a Jew. Baptism was for a Gentile who wanted to convert to Judaism. We call that a proselyte. Gentiles were the ones who needed to symbolically die to their old selves and fully embrace new life as one of God's covenant people. But those who were born into the covenant didn't need to, right? Wrong. You heard pastor say at the beginning. That's what John the Baptist started shaking things up with. He was telling Jews to repent and be baptized, and he was baptizing them. Jesus continued that thought. On this day, Peter continues and leaves nothing for them to misinterpret. Repent and then be baptized. Friend, what do you need to repent of this morning? Where does your thinking need to change? Are, are you like those who listen to Peter's message who, who need to change their thinking about Jesus? I mean, think about it. Just answer the question to yourself right now. Who is Jesus Christ? Who is he to you? Is he a myth? Is he a, a, a fairy tale, a, a tale fabricated to inspire some people or to enslave others? Maybe you're sitting here, he's a historical reality, but he's nothing other than any other revolutionary man. And you got guys like Jesus, Gandhi, Buddha, Muhammad, they're all the same. Friends, if Jesus is anything less than the Son of God, the Messiah, your Savior, Deliverer, and the Lord of your life, then you need to repent. You need to change your thinking about Him. You need to receive Him for who He really is, not who you thought He might be to this point. Now maybe you have done that in the past. Can I tell you that does not mean you're done repenting? Maybe you think rightly about Jesus, generally speaking, but wrongly about a number of other things. Maybe you're here and you've received Christ and you've even been baptized, but that doesn't mean you're sinless, friends. So where has conviction once stirred you, but now it's sort of gone silent within you? I would urge you to confess, say what God says about that, and repent this morning. Baptism is for those who have been convicted of sin, who have changed their thinking about that sin, but still, that's not all. Because it's not merely about changing your thinking, it's not about exchanging one wrong thought for another. Your thinking must be calibrated correctly. And that only comes with a heart change. And so ultimately, baptism is for those who have trusted in Christ for forgiveness of sin. Conviction of sin is a gift, but only if responded to correctly. Repentance is a gift, changing your thinking about sin, but only if your thinking is oriented in the right direction. It doesn't matter if you feel bad only to stuff it down and find a more creative way to sin next time. It doesn't matter if you change your mind only to pick up new bad, that, new bad habits and bad thoughts. What matters is that you turn from sin and to God through Jesus Christ. That your mind is oriented to Christ because your heart has been transformed by him. That's precisely Peter's next point. Let's pick it up at the beginning of 38. Remember? Peter, brothers, we're overcome with conviction. What should we do? Peter said to them, repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. The single most important part of our entire text this morning is that phrase, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of sins. Conviction doesn't matter if it doesn't lead to repentance, and repentance doesn't matter if we aren't turning to God. Amen. Amen. And that only occurs when we have been forgiven by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Now certainly, some people have tried to twist this verse around and claim that Peter is teaching that it's by baptism that you're forgiven. But that clearly goes against the witness of all of Scripture, and it's definitely not what Peter's saying here. Forgiveness of sins, being made right with God, the salvation of your soul, is a gift. It's not a work. There's absolutely nothing you can do to affect it, because Jesus did all the necessary work for you to be forgiven. 
Friends, we sang it. If you, were, if you were listening to the words we sang, he lived the perfect life. He's the only member of the human race to ever live a sinless life. And then he died the death that all mankind deserved, the death of a sinner. While he was not a sinner, make no mistake, he died the death of a sinner. That is, he died separated from God. And after he died, he was buried. He spent three days in the tomb. But on that third day, on that third day, he was raised to life again. Definitive proof, irrefutable proof that God said, I received your sacrifice. I accept your sacrifice, your substitution on behalf of all those who would believe. Friends, he did it all and he did it perfectly. And so all you can do is receive the gift of Jesus' perfect work by faith. And baptism. Well, that is a public picture of what happens when one receives that gift. You just saw it. Jessica and Joe weren't just dunked under the water. They were making a public declaration. I have trusted Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. In him, I have been made right with God. And so when they went into the water, we were reminded of Jesus' death. And when they were under the water, even for that brief millisecond, we were reminded of Jesus' burial. And when they came up out of the water, we were reminded that Jesus was raised Amen. to new life. And Praise since he was raised, we too will Amen. one day be raised. Praise the Lord. Yes. Friends, baptism is a profound portrait of what has been done in the hearts of each who have received the gift of salvation, who have trusted Christ for salvation. It's a beautiful picture of the new life that every true believer experiences when transferred from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of Jesus. And so when Peter says, repent, each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, he's calling his audience to change their thinking about Jesus. Stop rejecting and receive him. And then show us all that you have received him by being baptized. Understand, while baptism was not a foreign concept to the people at the time, being baptized in the name of someone most certainly was. Sure, there was, a, there was a purification baptism where someone dunking themselves in the water of might invoke the name of Yahweh, the covenant God. This is for you, Lord. But you know what? No one was ever baptized in the name of Moses. No one was ever baptized in the name of Samuel or David or Daniel or any other character in Jewish history. So this was revolutionary. To be baptized in the name of Jesus was to publicly declare, yes, he is the Lord, and he is the Messiah. Yes, salvation is only to be found in him. Yes, I once thought about him in this way, but now I confess him for who he is. I was wrong to think about him that way. I was sinful to think about him that way. I was sinful in my thoughts and my actions, but now I receive him. Friends, this is no casual response to Peter's message and the conviction that accompanied it. This was radical. And it immediately placed whoever responded in this way under a microscope and in the crosshairs of the spiritual leadership of that day. This public declaration is drawing a definitive line in the sand. I am with Jesus. I am committed to him. I am trusting him to be made right with God. I am trusting him to be forgiven. And it has nothing to do with God. Don't miss what Peter says here. What will be a result of receiving forgiveness in Christ? Well, anyone who did that would receive the Holy Spirit. Just like the apostles. So what's happening right now? They've been demonstrating just a whisper of the power of the Spirit by speaking in languages that they didn't even know. And Peter says, guess what? You can have that same Spirit. You can be sealed by Him. You can receive Him, be permanently indwelt and empowered by Him too. And so, what a remarkable promise for everyone listening. But here's what's truly remarkable. That command, repent, be baptized, that promise of forgiveness in Jesus and the receipt of the Holy Spirit, it's not just for those in attendance. Listen to what Peter says. The promise is for you and your children and for all who are far away, as many as the Lord our God will call 
to himself. Amen. The promise is for you. That is, the Jews who were in attendance, who would receive his message and put their trust in Jesus. But then he says, and for your children. That is, for their descendants who did the same. But look here. For all who are far away. Who's that? That's you and I. That's you and I, friends. For all who are far away, we are those who were once alienated from the people of God, but now who have been brought near by the blood of Jesus. Don't miss how astounding this would have been to them and should continue to be for us. Being a part of God's people was now about about an ethnic status. It was not about some ritual of converting to a national religion. It was about putting trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And don't miss it. Who's the one orchestrating it all? It's God. As many as the Lord our God will call to himself. God has the authority and ability to call whomever he wishes to salvation. And for those who respond to that call, who receive the gift by faith, it doesn't matter if you're Jew, Gentile, male, female, slave, free. It doesn't matter. The promise is for all who God calls to himself. That's simply amazing. Baptism is for those who have been convicted of sin, repented of that sin, trusted Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of that sin, and finally, baptism is for those who wish to join the community of faith. Those who wish to join the community of faith. You've probably heard it said before that Christianity is not about religion, it's about a relationship. A relationship with Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and a right relationship with God as a result. That's true. Religion without a relationship with Jesus is pointless. It achieves nothing. But that being said, sometimes we get so focused on the personal relationship that we neglect the corporate dimension of our faith. The Christian life, while rooted in a personal relationship with Jesus, was never meant to be lived apart from the community of faith. Christians are meant to be a part of a local body of believers, and pu baptism publicly declares, first, I'm a servant of Christ. I'm committed to him. But then secondly, I am also joined to all of these, my spiritual brothers and sisters who have also publicly professed allegiance to Christ. That's why in just a few minutes, we're going to collectively welcome Joe and Jessica and others who have professed faith in Jesus and previously been baptized. We're, we're going to, in a few minutes, Lord willing, we're going to welcome them into membership of this local assembly of believers. And in doing so, we're really following the example of the infant church on the day of Pentecost. Let's finish out our text. Verse 40. With many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, save yourselves from this perverse generation. So Luke lets us know Peter's teaching wasn't over for the day. We had the part of the message that God wanted us to have, but apparently he had a whole lot more to say to the people present. And all of that teaching could be summed up with the simple phrase, save yourself from this perverse generation. Now, don't misunderstand. Peter's not saying that they could literally save themselves in the sense of affecting their own salvation. He already made it clear. Forgiveness of sins is in Jesus. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. But what he is doing is urging people to hear and to receive the offer of salvation. Don't waste the conviction you're feeling. Repent. Receive Jesus Christ and be baptized in his name. What's Peter saying? Don't go down with the sinking ship of this wicked generation. The word for perverse is only used a few times in the New Testament. It refers to that which is twisted, what's crooked and corrupt. That word is actually where we get our English word for scoliosis. And if you know what that is, it's a, a curvature, a, a twisting, a crooked spine, right? That's how Peter describes the generation around him. It's something's not right, it's out of place. But here's the reality. There's nothing particularly crooked about Peter's generation. At least not compared to every generation before and every generation since. The fact is that until sin is completely done away with, every generation will continue to be perverse, twisted, crooked, corrupt. And no matter what your relationship is with God this morning, if you're truthful this morning, you cannot help but look around and acknowledge we are living in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. You can't deny it. We ignore plain biological facts to rewrite rules of gender. 
We kill babies and call it health care. We take what someone has worked very, very hard for and give it to someone who's done nothing but demand it. Corrupt, crooked, perverted. That's our generation. And so friends, I want to make the same appeal to you that Peter made a couple thousand years ago. Save yourself from this perverse generation. How? Receive the gift of salvation. Not tomorrow, not next week, next month, today. Today is the day of salvation. If you've been convicted this morning, it's not me. That's God shaking you from your stupor. So wake up. Don't waste it. Repent, change your thinking. First about who he is and who you are. And then receive forgiveness in Jesus' name because of what he accomplished for you and I. I urge you, would you think about these things? Would you give them the attention they deserve? Because when you walk out of here, you cannot say you haven't been warned. So what will you do? That's the same question that was for Peter's audience. What would they do? Because every time that people hear the things that you have heard today, one of three things happens. You, some people flat out reject it. What is this blubbering fool talking about? Some of you are sitting there thinking, I'm a fool and you just wish you, I would shut up. That's a, that's a common response. I get that. I understand it. You can't wait to get out of here. That happens every time these things are spoken about. Some people hear them and they, they delay. I don't like feeling like this. So don't talk to me about it anymore. Talk to me about it later, in a week, in a month, in a year. But you know what? You'll never think about them again, unless it's brought up to you again. Delay is just another form of rejection. Some of you. Some of you will receive the things you have heard, and by grace through faith, you will act on them. You will respond to the conviction, you will repent where necessary, and trust Jesus Christ, which is exactly what some of those in Peter's audience did. So those who accepted his message were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were added. This wasn't everyone in attendance. That's not even close. But a huge number of people came to faith. They heard what Peter said and they accepted it. And the proof was that they were baptized. Right then and there. Don't miss it. About 3,000. 1,000 people, 3,000 souls came to Jesus Christ by grace through faith that day. And after being baptized, it says, they were added. You say, well, what does that mean? And somebody just counted them up? They, they came to a sum? They tallied the number? No, that's not it at all. What were they added to? Well, simply put, the church. This is back in chapter 1. When they had entered, they went to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon, the zealot, Judas, the son of James. All of these, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. That's your first church, ladies and gentlemen. And what started as a group of about 120 people that had trusted in Jesus and met together to pray and worship together in a single day, exploded by adding 3,000 more to their number. And it was the waters of baptism that announced their shared faith and their new relationship, not only with the Lord Jesus Christ, but with one another. What a day that must have been. What a day that must have been. But do you understand that we tasted just a little bit of that today, of what that was like. We, we saw Joe and Jessica make the same public declaration that Peter's audience had so many years before. Praise God for what we witnessed today. So who should be baptized? The simple answer is every true believer in Jesus Christ. Those who have been convicted, those who have repented, have trusted Christ for forgiveness, and those who wish to be obedient in publicly declaring their new relationship with Christ and one another. And so if you're here this morning and you've never trusted Christ, I urge you, save yourself from this perverse generation. And friends, if you have done that, but you've never been baptized, and I'm not talking about baby baptism. Babies don't feel convicted. Babies can't confess their sin. They can't change their thinking about it. 
I'm talking about of your own volition as an act of your will. If you have not said publicly, I want to declare my allegiance and obedience to Christ, then I urge you to think about those things, to do that. Don't keep your faith a secret. Tell the world, I belong to Christ. So if you want to know more about baptism, if you want to know more about church membership, talk to me. Talk to Pastor. Raise your hand. Talk to Marty. Raise your hand. Talk to Jim. Where's Jim? Raise your hand. There you go. We would be happy to talk with you about any of those things. It would be my delight and theirs as well. Don't walk out of here disobedient to the Lord. So what are our next steps as a result of God's word today? First, cherish conviction. I said it. Conviction's a gift. Don't waste it. Don't stuff it down. Don't ignore it. Praise God for it and act accordingly, which includes the need to regularly repent. <laughs> Certainly there is an initial repentance when you receive Jesus, but then as His Spirit continues to gift you with conviction in your life, keep repenting. Keep changing your thinking where He leads you to change. Right? Put off that sin, have your mind renewed, and put on righteousness. That is the cycle of sanctification. Being made holy. Finally, continuously trust Christ. Trust Him for the forgiveness of your sins, the salvation that accompanies it, but then continue to trust Him for the grace and mercy you need to live the life He has called you. Friends, don't just trust Him with the big stuff. Trust Him with the little stuff and everything in between. That's being poor in spirit. Every single day from the moment you wake up, I trust you today, Lord Jesus. Thank you for what you have done for me, and I trust that you will be with me every minute of this day, and I will never not need you. So I trust you. He is the only one who will never leave you or forsake you. Period. So why would you not trust him? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, how it instructs us, how it corrects our thinking, how it calls us to action. You have done that this morning, and so I pray that the response would be overwhelming obedience to you and your word, that you would be glorified in it. I pray in Jesus' name.